All right. Well, welcome back, everyone. Uh, hopefully, we still have a few folks on the webcast uh, from their offices and uh, some folks on the call, I see. So that's great. Thank you for rejoining. Uh, folks in the room, hope you had good lunch, made some friends, built some bridges across professions and sectors and expertise. That is the spirit of multi-stakeholderism that we have come to know, love, and occasionally roll our eyes at. Uh, we're going to pick up with the discussion from the working group. Uh, this next working group, uh, the final one, is uh, focusing on some of the real meaty policy issues that we're going to be facing. And then after this, we're going to talk about it, then we're going to zoom out and have a little bit of a big picture discussion about where this broader initiative is going uh, and how we can sort of get the outputs out to the wide world and what is the pathway that the work that we've been doing is actually going to lead to better security in the ecosystem. But, John, you're going to set us up in that direction. Great. Well, thanks, Alan. Um, thanks, everybody, for sticking around. So I know we're, we're right after lunch. It's a little warm in here. Under your seat, there's pillows. So feel free to, to grab those if you want to take a little nap. Um, so my name is John Banghart. And so I've been helping out with Working Group 4. I've been participating in some of the other groups as well. But I've been co-chairing this one uh, along with my co-chair, Vic Chung, who is on the line. I uh, wasn't able to be here with us today. Um, but we've had a really interesting time with this Working Group dealing with incentives and barriers and adoption. And just to sort of frame this out, um, just a little bit of history for those of you that weren't on the group, and I know there's at least a couple of you who have been. We struggled right out of the gate to figure out what the right sort of angle of attack is here, right? Because the concept of incentives and barriers are pretty broad. And even in the scope that we've talked about here, that is limiting this to primarily consumer devices, limiting it to upgradability, um, even within that narrowed scope, trying to address what our incentives and what our barriers can get you know, fa fairly nebulous fairly quickly. So we did talk a lot about that at the beginning. We didn't want to take the obvious approach, right, and say, well, OK, companies are incentivized to make profit. Consumers are incentivized to buy new things. There, we're done, right? We did it. Um, that would have been too simple, and that's sort of obvious. We also knew that we could go down an awful lot of rabbit holes here, right? You could choose a particular type of device, a particular type of industry, and you could spend a ton of time sort of working your way through into a lot of detail. So instead, um, as we thought through these questions, we thought, or, or tried to arrive at this, we were thinking, well, rather than focus on any one particular device um, or, or one particular uh, piece of this problem, Let's think about the decision-making process, right? What goes into the decision-making process? What influences decisions around, do we build upgradability into products? Do we not build upgradability into products? How do consumers factor into this? Um, we heard some stuff about consumers from one of the other working groups. So that was the decision that we took, um, for better or for worse, and we'll find out. Um, so this is a bit uh, of an eye chart, I apologize, and I didn't create handouts even though Alan gave me the opportunity to do so and I chose not to, so I now regret that. Um, but in any event, um, these slides are available, hopefully you've received them already. But we had to do some definitions right up front, right? We had to at least come to an agreement in the group. If we're going to talk about incentives and barriers, we need to understand a few things, right? We need to understand what are the different vectors where incentives and barriers could come into play. And also, who are the stakeholders when it comes to incentives and barriers? So particularly, I think, when you look at the major stakeholder groups, we settled on three, right? And, and we sort of made these definitions up. They're loosely grounded in other definitions that you're probably familiar with. And certainly, we'll be looking for feedback from the broader group on whether these make sense. Um, but producers, right? There's anybody that is involved in the production of, of an IoT device. Um, or service, and I'll come back to that. Um, users can be humans. We also treated users as being machines, right? We had a notion of machine-to-machine -machine IoT. That is, one machine using other devices for some extended purpose, right? Which is why we chose the term user instead of consumer. We wanted to recognize the fact that devices will interplay with each other. Um, it's not just about the human device interaction. Um, and then regulators. We all know what, what regulators are. The environmental, interactive, and scale um, will become a little clearer as I go through some examples here. So what we did was, based off of these definitions, we tried to build out um, sort of what, what you could call a taxonomy uh, and tried to build out some sort of a framework in which we could develop some use cases. Right? So as you look at this, you can see on the left side, we've got our primary stakeholders. Um, and in each case, we tried to break it into some sort of logical category. We recognize this is imperfect. We recognize that there are levels of granularity that go far beneath this. But for the purposes of what we were trying to achieve, this was a useful construct. 
So importantly, and we heard about this earlier, um, it's easy to think about software and hardware in terms of a device, but there is this service element, right? There is the networking, there is the protocols, there are all these other pieces. So if you think about um, you know, uh, a light bulb, we've been using that example today. There's somebody who manufactures the hardware, the physical light bulb. Um, there may very well be somebody else that manufactures the software that runs the light bulb. Um, there is some sort of a network operator that controls the network between the light bulb and the app that you're running. There's there's another developer that may actually develop that app or may have an ecosystem of apps like alarm.com or somebody like that. Um, so there really are multiple pieces here, even with one single device, and we wanted to make a recognition of that. And then the environmental interactive and scale pieces will become a little bit clearer when I run through a couple examples, so I won't spend a lot of time here at the, or there at the moment. So human, again, our, our users, I mentioned, we, we think about this from both human and machine. And then regulators, we used, took a little bit of liberty here, and I used the term regulator to be both sort of the normal enforcement regulator, but also voluntary, right? So thinking about trade associations, industry organizations that come together to agree, this is something we want to do, PCI, others like that. So it's a little bit of a uh, loose use of the word regulator, so I apologize for that. It's a useful construct. Um, so. Based off of this, then, we tried to, to go and actually start doing some use cases. And it took us a while to get to that point. Um, and we were struggling quite a bit around, OK, well, now we've got this notion of, of this taxonomy uh, for this decision-making process, but what do we do with it? So we finally started to go through some use case developments. We developed several of them. Um, we are going to produce a white paper that will have more information in it. Um, it's not ready to go yet, which is why you don't have it, but that will be one of the outcomes. Um, just some examples we came up with, connected dishwasher. I have that emboldened here because I'm going to use that as our example as we dig into this a little bit deeper. But supermarket devices to track automated inventory, um, trash cans, things like that. The list goes on and on and on. Um, we recognized that risk is an important factor here, and it's come up once or twice in our conversations today. We actually went on a bit of a, I won't call it a tangent, but we, we took a turn at one point and started to think about this in terms of risk and risk management. Um, and perhaps unsurprisingly at this point, what we found that while that is potentially a useful avenue, uh, it's also, again, another type of a rabbit hole, right? You could go on and start talking about risk effectively eternally because you have to boil the ocean when you start thinking about the interconnectedness of all of these devices. And I forget who it was, but somebody this morning was talking about the fact, you know, you have a hub that's connected to a thermostat that may be connected to a furnace that's connected to all these different things, and there's different risk elements associated with each of them. So while we did go down that path, we decided that's not going to be uh, an approachable path for us for the purposes of this um, discussion. So we did do that. But so I wanted to mention it because it's an important thing to remember that this is all about ultimately managing risk. Um, and then we thought about personification and design thinking to try and put ourselves into the shoes of you know, what would these stakeholders be thinking? Um, our group is fairly diverse. Um, we've had a good core of people that have been there sort of week over week. Um, IT, civil society, some trade associations. Um, we haven't had a lot of manufacturing representation. And so that's an area that if that's a space that you work in, we would love to have. Uh, think about that producer category that I had up there. That's an area that I think we could really benefit from some additional insight. Um, but we, again, tried to put ourselves into the shoes in these use cases and, and move things forward. Um, so again, a little hard to read. I apologize. But what I did here was think about that taxonomy that I had up on the screen before. <laughs> using the dishwasher example. So here I'm taking a producer um, of the software that runs the dishwasher. And what we tried to do was insert then some real life things, right? Some aspects. So some of the things it says up there, even I can't see it and I'm standing right here. Um, so for example, an environmental barrier for a producer of dishwasher software might be, um, what's a good one? Uh, well, scale, support of legacy devices, right? And this has come up a few times. So you've got somebody who's responsible for producing and updating software over time, but scale is a barrier for them, right? Because that's going to introduce complexity into them being to push it out. And it was somebody, I don't, it might have been the gentleman from CA or, or someone from over here, I don't recall, was talking about the fact that if you've got millions and millions of devices that you're responsible for, scale is an issue for you. It is a barrier to actually building upgradability into your products and could influence your decision to say, you know what, it's too big of a problem, it's going to get too expensive, I'm just not going to bother. Right? So that becomes a barrier now for the producer. And I could go on and on through these. But I think you get the idea that what we wanted to do now was take this taxonomy and test it out. Does it work? Can we start inserting real world examples and arrive at something meaningful? Um, so that was useful up to a point. 
And so qualitative sorts of approaches make a lot of sense. I don't manufacture dishwashers, and my dishwasher is not connected. So my input around all of that was largely just, I'm going to make this up. I'm going to, we're going to imagine what this might be like. So while we couldn't necessarily come up with fully robust examples given the, the group that we had, what we did was wanted to do was now we wanted to take this, this sort of methodology, how do we think about this problem space, to the next step, to try and move it away from purely qualitative and start to get into a little bit more of a quantitative space. So we thought about it from the perspective of, this is just one example, using a Likert scale um, to kind of ask questions around the various components that we came up with. So here's some examples, and so I'll just read this to you. So for example, it says producer. Um, one of the things that you could put in front of a producer is I expect to support this device for several years, right? That could be an incentive on scale. And they're going to say, I strongly agree, I strongly disagree, and so on. For a user, new features are important to me. Right? That's an interactive incentive, potentially. Strongly agree, disagree. Regulator, this device impacts users' physical safety. All right? I strongly agree with that. I strongly disagree with it. And then trying to turn that into something useful, we went here. And so again, I don't know how well you can see it. But so where I have the producer up top, it says, I expect to support this device for several years. I made that strongly agree. Producer, providing new features to users is important, strongly agree. Producer, patching could introduce new vulnerabilities, strongly agree. All right, making these up, but you get the point. So what we end up with here now is given the nature of these questions and recognizing too that in any situation like this, you would have far more complexity to try to arrive at the truth. This is just examples. But you end up hopefully with something that says in this case, you've got really strong incentives, but you also have really strong barriers. So what does that tell us about what needs to happen? Situations like that could actually be really hard to make progress on, right? Because maintaining the status quo is going to be the easiest thing to do. Because moving off of that space could become really difficult. So pivot that to something else where now we have really strong incentives. Um, you know, producing new features is important to me, but really weak barriers, right? Somebody says, I don't think patching is going to introduce vulnerabilities for whatever reason. So now you've got an interesting case where you've got strong incentives, weak barriers, um, and you could see that maybe now there's an opportunity to advocate for change internally. So if I'm manufacturing this dishwasher and I know that as a company we've got strong incentives to build up great ability in, but I have weak barriers based off of the analysis that I've done, that might suggest that I can work internally in my company, right, to make the case we need to have upgradability in our products. Um, the opposite example is a course where you have very poor incentive uh, but you have strong barriers. So again, using the same thing. This could be a device that maybe the manufacturer doesn't expect to have a long life period, right? They don't expect that the life cycle of this device is going to be very long. Um, providing the users to features, they don't care about that, right? Whatever, you get what you get. And that said, I, I don't plan on ever giving any of you new features. Um, and I'm really worried that if I do patch stuff or if I build the ability to build uh, upgrade ability into my product, um, that somebody's going to use that as an attack vector. New code's going to get inserted, whatever the case may be. So now you've got a situation where you have really weak incentives. The company just doesn't really care about it for good or bad reasons. But you have really strong barriers, right? They're really concerned about the potential risk that that might introduce. So in that case, you've got a situation where instituting change on the inside of the company could be really, really hard. Right? Because you're not going to be able to convince the leadership, you're not going to be able to convince the board that building upgradability into your product makes sense because there's not enough incentives and there's, a, there's a barriers around it that are really going to be difficult to get past. So that's all looking at it from a, single, um, from a single stakeholder perspective. I was using producer there. But you can also extrapolate this to start thinking about this from a multiple, multiple excuse me, stakeholder perspective as well. So in this particular example, you've got a strong regulator incentive Right? because maybe the, the product here is going to be dangerous to consumers. Um, you may have a strong producer barrier or with a weak regulator incentive, right? or you may have a strong regulator incentive and a strong barrier to scale factors and so on. So we can spend all afternoon sort of running through the different scenarios. But the point being that we think that what we have is a way to at least start thinking about these problems as opposed to just saying reduce liability, make it more profitable, convince users that they need this, that, or the other thing. Those are all important aspects, but those are also well-known aspects. And we think there's a complexity and some nuance around Internet of Things that requires a little bit of an approach that might allow some of that nuance to come through. This is by no means a complete solution, um, but it's something that we sort of arrived at and that we think as we start building more examples into it, it seems to be bearing out. So moving forward on this subject, um, 
perceived and actual strength obviously uh, are, are somewhat subjective. So in those previous charts that I had up there, whether somebody strongly agrees or disagrees, there's still subjectivity involved in that. It's going to be hard to get around it. Um, but that's an area that we're thinking about. And then what influences that, right? What influences a, a producer or a consumer uh, or a regulator? What influences their perception of, well, that's a good incentive versus that's a good barrier? Um, meaning of change can, mean, can be very subjective as well. Right? And we, talk, we spent a lot of time talking about the fact, well, is upgradability always a desired outcome? Right? There's sort of an implicitness in this argument that we've been making that, well, upgradability is a better thing. But, and we've even heard from some people today that you know, maybe it's not always the best thing to do, that maybe there's a risk strategy in certain cases where you might say upgradability is not a good thing. Right? So you have to factor in the idea of what does change mean? You could foresee a circumstance where somebody has a product that is upgradable and they say, this is a complete disaster. Let's take upgradability out of our product moving forward, right? And that, they may see that as a positive change and it may in fact be one. So we have to maintain that sort of perspective. And I think the key here, and I sort of mentioned this up front, is that you know, we don't necessarily at this point have groundbreaking recommendations around here's how you incentivize this group and here's how you tear down these barriers. I think the point that we're trying to make is that that is so varied and so complex that there is no easy way to just say, this is an incentive, this is a barrier. So we're spending some time continuing to think about all that and where it could take us. So similar to the other working groups, I mean, what we care about here is, you know, first of all, have we identified the right stakeholders? Are there nuances in the identification of the stakeholders, the producers, the users, and the regulators uh, that maybe haven't been captured? Is there any utility to this approach? Or could there be? Right? Even if this approach of Likert scale followed up by mapping that out, developing some sort of combined qualitative, quantitative formula around how do we determine strong incentives, weak incentives, and so on. Um, and then ultimately, you know, what are we missing? Have we overthought this? Have we made it overly complicated? Should we just have stuck with reduce liability for manufacturers, educate consumers, and we're done? So um, I'll stop there and take questions, comments. Angry lunch throwing, yes. Two thoughts, one, one is purely uh, definitional on your... Uh, Michael, you just introduce yourself? Oh, sorry, Michael Eisenberg. I'm uh, chairman of the American Bar Association Information Security Committee. Um, on your, since our last update slide, the, the, under the regulator, I would suggest uh, just as a, a, um, an editorial uh, amendment that you substitute some other word for the word standard, which those in the voluntary standards community are very protective of and consider to be a term of art. And I think what you're referring to here generically is something more like a norm or an authority. Uh, yeah, that, that makes sense. I usually draw the distinction of lowercase standard versus uppercase standard, but maybe that's an and then um, sort of in general, under the concept of user, the way your charts bake out, uh, given the example of a, of a product that could f slide along the scale from being a residential consumer product all the way to an industrial product, depending on what context the dishwasher or a refrigerator were placed in, for example, a, a sub-zero in a government bio lab versus in a, in a, a residence, um, I, I would suggest uh, possibility of trying to run that same set of, of analyses against uh, a static notion of uh, the other two variables, but a, but a dynamic uh, across a spectrum of, of uh, one of the uh, stakeholders, in this case, consumer, run the same thing for uh, residential consumer, uh, industrial consumer, government consumer, high-end consumer, uh, around the same product. I think you might find the analysis would vary uh, even within that, that narrow frame. Uh, well, I hope that it would, <laughs> right? I mean, it would be weird if, it, if this whole methodology ended up with the same result every time. Um, I will say that, you know, we, we your point is 100% valid. We specifically stayed away from running analysis outside of the really specific sort of home consumer space because um, that, that really is the scope that we were given, you know, to try to address this and not get outside of it. But I think you're right. I mean, I think hopefully if you start plugging in other things here, what the methodology gets you is some way of getting slightly better informed on given the set of circumstances, given my target market, given the potential risk, 
how easy or hard or how motivated or unmotivated am I going to be to actually build upgradability into my product? Well, and I think that issue goes to the question of the establishment of norms and, and what communities can be relied on to produce norms. The pressure for uh, safety and security and efficacy of, a, of an FDA type would apply to a, a product like a, a, lab, a refrigerator being used in a bio lab or pharmaceutical lab industrial setting uh, at a very different degree than if it's in the residential consumer setting where the only thing it's telling you is whether you need to buy more milk. Yeah, certainly. I mean, and that's, you know, I, that was part of the debate we had around do we want to turn this into a risk management exercise, right, or a risk assessment exercise. And we decided, for the reasons I laid out, that, this, that our group was not going to be able to tackle that problem for all the reasons you're highlighting. There is, pragmatically speaking, an infinite number of scenarios that you could sit and lay out, and it changes the calculus on this stuff. So it's, it's challenging. We had to scope it somehow. John, can you talk a little bit more about your planned white paper? Like, who is your target audience? I don't know, to be honest. I mean, part of what we need to do here is figure out, <clears throat> well, I took it off the slide, but you know, are we even heading in a direction that's going to be useful, right? And we laid out some of the other avenues we could have taken but decided on this one. Um, and I think we need to understand from the broader group and try and get more people engaged on this, you know, is this a path forward that we want to continue to explore? And I think that will help us define who is the target audience. The paper basically has the same content, just with more examples, more narrative. Um, but I don't want to publish something if folks are looking at this and saying, well, this maybe sort of might be intellectually interesting, but no one's ever going to use it, right? What do you think? Um, I think it's more than just intellectually interesting. I think it needs more investigation, right? But any methodology or taxonomy is going to be that way. So we have to figure out, do we want to define or further refine, excuse me, um, this approach? Um, following even some of the examples that he gave around, all right, let's start plugging in other use cases here and see what comes out of this. Ultimately, what we want, our original target audience we thought was going to be, and maybe still is, the decision makers around who decides or who influences whether upgradability and patchability are available in a, pro in a device or not. And that's why we arrived at our stakeholders. The producers can make that decision. Consumers can influence it, right, by saying, well, I'm only going to buy this product or that product if, you know, Consumer Reports says that it's really upgradable. Um, and then, of course, regulators can. So the goal, I think, is to try and create some sort of a tool set, um, to use the terms more loosely, that decision makers, regardless of where they are, producer, user, um, regulator, can help to, to motivate them. So, I punted so, on an answer to your question, but that's what I got. Let's start Who's here, next? and we'll go around the uh, room to capture the comments. All right, so uh, this is James Simister from Panasonic. Um, as you're talking about the stakeholders, one of the things that struck me is that um, integrators might be another category to think about. Um, they're kind of a unique hybrid between a producer and a user. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I think they, they have their own sets of challenges trying to sometimes bridge the gap between a, a producer and a user. Um, but that, I was just thinking that, that might be another interesting um, stakeholder to consider. I like that. That makes sense. Should I ask you a Microphone. Microphone. Thank you. White paper is a good idea, but for a higher level, yes, it is. Uh, it helps, but um, like as we are talking already, like use cases and test case studies, those things will be very helpful for the implementation. Use case, you may say application use case. Okay, you can do this this kind of a thing. Test case uh, solution references, if you give, like for example, in one of the industry, this has been implemented like this. Like for example, automotive, this is the kind of a thing. The same use case may be played in a different way, like in automotive or in a medical scenario or in a home uh, automation or a lab automation kind of a thing. So those kind of a things, if we have to show that as an example, not many, couple of them if we show, use case, multiple test solutions, and this is the upgradability white paper. So all these three may help in uh, moving forward. That makes sense. Craig and then Ralph. Uh, thank you. Um, 
you know, I provide some comments earlier. I, my, my recommendation is we focus it on the producer. I mean, users aren't going to be coming to NTIA site. They're not going to be reading this. I mean, we know that, I think, at least we know that intuitively. Um, but I will tell you that companies that are trying to bring products and services to market are hungry for direction. And we can't, we can't solve and serve all three audiences. The other part, and it gets back to Michael's comments about some other type of devices, is in some of the working groups, we've really tried to keep focus. Who, what, what type of products or services are we talking about? We, um, and I, I think in some of the groups, we said basically consumer grade devices that are used in the home, or used in the office, or including wearable technologies. And by design, um, since the FDA has sort of regulatory oversight in their, their world, not to swim in that lane, and the National Traffic uh, Safety Board has their, so not to focus on automotive. So, but I think it's very important that we keep focus. It can't be so broad that it covers those other areas. And, and again, if we're trying to make an impact, when we look at 500 new IoT consumer grade devices being brought to market every week, they need that prescriptive advice and direction more than anyone else. So that would be my recommendation. I'd be hopefully happy to hear if anyone out comments on that, on those points. Uh, two finger over here. Uh, next time I'll do three in Boy Scout. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, from my little world, uh, um, when we design and, and build uh, data centers, uh, we try and herd the cats around certain tiering tier one, tier two, tier three, tier four type of infrastructures and possibly under certain consumer uh, groups and, and industrial automotive, all these different groups, it might fall out that there's certain reliability aspects to, to group consumers into to try and define uh, parameters around upgrades and security if that makes any sense. I didn't track it 100%, I'm sorry. You lost me somewhere. So you're, you're suggesting that there is an additional sort of granularity to how to define a user that may impact whether security updates should or right. shouldn't be available? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I, mean, I think that's true. Um, I think all of this is true. What I struggle with, maybe I'm the only one that struggles with it, but when we start to talk along those lines, the horizon just keeps going further and further out, right? And so you, you end up with a situation where you say, wow, no matter what we solve, there's always going to be more problems. Um, and so I think there's a balancing act between recognizing that the horizon is infinite, but that there are immediate concerns, right? So it's what do we do with the immediate concerns from, you know, my background is oper I'm an operator, right? So I'm an op operations guy. So I think about how do I solve the risk now that plugging in this connected thermostat is bringing into my home or into my business? I recognize that down the line, somebody's going to create something that's going to connect to my thermostat, that's going to create to something, connect to something, to connect to something. I can't fix that problem, right? That's just market driven. So that's going to happen no matter what. But if I can piecemeal the problem out, if I have some way of approaching it and saying, for this given device, I can at least somehow gauge the risk and put some sort of mitigation in place that helps the risk to at least be knowable and partly controllable, if not entirely. So I think that's, well, I'm repeating myself, but I think scoping here is incredibly important. Got it. Two finger from Ralph, then we're gonna go to Jason on the phone and then back to Michael. Okay, um, so with respect to, we identify the right stakeholders, I suggest that there's one that's missing, which is everybody else. Mm -hmm. um, and I say that somewhat facetiously, but it's the fact that the, the stakeholders who could be potentially affected, for example, from distributed DDoS attacks, are not the actual user of the device, right? So there is this uh, impact to others um, that are affected by what, what is done with the device itself. Um, so, I mean, I've heard um, IoT security being identified as a tragedy of the commons. Um, so in some sense, that might get to uh, incentives. Um, but to be a little bit more practical um, in, in, in the application of the use cases you're, you're identifying, I think there are actually a fairly limited number you need to look at. Mm -hmm. And um, IoT analytics does a great job in terms of segmenting the IoT marketplace. And they pretty much broke into two different categories at the top level, right? 
There's what they call IoT to C, which is to consumers, and IoT to B. And I think the incentives are different, but are, you know, within the IoT to B category, they're, they're fairly similar. And within the IoT to C category, they're fairly similar. So if you look at just those two scenarios, they, they may drive out the fundamentals. They vary in to some degree, mm -hmm. but, but orientationally, I think they're, they're fairly good. So if you think about it in, the, in those two broad categories, I think you can simplify the number of use cases you need to think about. Those two generalizations may be sufficient. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, we have uh, Jason on the phone. Angela, do we still have Jason? His line Hello? is open. Hey, Jason, we can hear you. Ah, okay. Um, so I was thinking about the, the target audience question, and it got me thinking about, you know, how would this information be useful to me? Um, and it would, I think getting some information, not just about, because we can talk about, you know, the voluntary stuff versus the, uh, you know, versus sort of the he more heavy handed stuff, whether that's regulatory or if somebody's deploying a solution through, uh, through a provider in the provider setting, you know, you must secure X, Y, and Z or else you're not going to be included in our service offering. That kind of stuff can come down from on high, but I think other worthwhile information would be from, you know, from the, either the manufacturers or developers who are building this stuff, you know, what is the lowest threshold that would, you know, that would convince them to, to do this stuff, you know, like what, what is it that would make it easy enough for them to do it that they would say, well, yeah, you know, once we, once it re reaches these criteria, then we would absolutely build upgradability into our devices, you know. Yeah, no, I think, I think that's right. And I think, you know, we, we try and capture that in the taxonomy that we put together is, you know, trying to fit exactly what you're saying as both an incentive or a reduction in barrier, right? So you could foresee, to your point, um, a technological advancement, right? Maybe it's improvements in how we patch products, whatever it may be, that lowers the barrier to the point where now the incentives outweigh the barrier, and so the right. producers are sort of automatically then incentivized to do it. So I agree with you 100%. Great. Michael and Justin. I want to uh, um, strongly disagree in part and agree with, in part with the gentleman across from me who uh, commented regarding the market segmentation uh, and applicability issue. Uh, I don't know how many other people uh, participating in this exercise were part of the, the NIST public working group on uh, cyber physical systems, but uh, one of the in, uh, reasons that that report, that uh, those 200 pages are, in my view, so inaccessible to the point of being constipated uh, uh, is that there, there was a failure to do exactly what you are doing here, which is develop uh, a suite of use cases as precursors to any advice that, uh, and their document was meant to be advice to standards bodies, developers, and a, a range of uh, pre-market communities. So I, I think there's great value in doing this irrespective of whether you're going to apply it to the consumer space, to the industrial space, or uh, some combination of, of those. Uh, when it comes to autos or medical devices, while it may be that there's federal preemption, uh, when it comes to the actual use of, of vehicles or medical devices, uh, I, I just uh, uh, heard uh, FTC Commissioner uh, uh, speaking at an IoT panel last week and agreeing with a comment that I made in front of the Attorneys General two weeks ago, which is, there will be state liability legislation uh, separate from uh, the uh, FDA's review of connected medical devices based on these issues, on the connectivity and IT issues, separate from the medical clinical efficacy issues. Those will not be able to be preempted. They're not going to defang the ability of the citizen to get a remedy when they are injured by a device because it's incorporated bad software and became hacked. The clinical efficacy perhaps will, will still be preempted. And I think the same thing is still true for vehicles. So I think there's a huge market for these use cases that define an appropriate suite of, of uh, uh, preconditions to the, and uh, an analytics available to the standards developers, to the early stage product engineers that helps them define what features need to be incorporated in their products in order to satisfy some what will emerge to be consensual demands from the marketplace? Thank you. Harley. 
So. Oh, I'm sorry. Excuse me, Justin. That, that's okay. That's sorry. okay. I go. I can go after him. Harley. Um. So, in in, in talking about uh, scope and what will uh, bring the most value on this particular topic, my uh, you know, you 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 should do what you feel appropriate. But my personal opinion is probably that I I think that you'll find enough. Uh, diversity of use cases and diversity of uh, incentives and barriers to adoption among producers alone. And I think that gives you your, the most bang for your buck. We've talked a lot about how, uh, how diverse and how varied IoT deployments are and all the different products that there are. And I think that uh, you know, you'll find different uh, uh, incentives and barriers among different deployments, you know, depending on the, on the vertical. And I think it's also a lot more difficult to nail down uh, things like barriers and incentives for users, for regulators, um, because I think a lot of them will be a lot more amorphous. Uh, regulators, for example, have, uh, I, I've worked in government, I know, that, I know that you have, there's, there's politics, mm -hmm. right? And that's, that is actually a huge barrier or incentive, depending on, on, on you know, which position the person is in. Uh, to, to regulate or not to regulate and how to regulate. Same thing with users. A lot of users uh, come from you know, such a huge array of backgrounds. Anyway, you, you, you get the point. And in the end, I feel like what we're talking, what we're talking about um, is the upgradability of IoT devices and the only people who are really gonna be able to do that, who are really gonna be able to build in that functionality are the producers. Mm -hmm. And I think that you could have a, uh, uh, a full white paper, you'll have no shortage of content in just discussing the incentives, barriers to adoption for producers alone. In so fact, I, I'd be a little surprised if, if it's not been done already and if it hasn't, then this fills a gap. Yeah, so I, I, I don't disagree with you, I struggle to figure out, and I think our group has struggled to figure out how do we separate producers from consumers when you talk about incentives and barriers, right? Because they become incentives and barriers to each other. Mm -hmm. So, but what you may be describing is, you know, maybe we need to reduce the, the, or alter the tact a little bit here to think about, okay, let's recognize the fact that, well, ultimately producers are trying to sell to consumers. Um, let's recognize that and let's take those sorts of incentives and barriers off the table and think about scoping it to maybe it's more of the environmental and the scale issues and less the interactive issues as we've identified because that's where most of the consumer interaction comes in. Focus on what are the technical advancements that might make this easier for people to implement. Is that kind of where you're headed? You know, maybe? I was thinking uh, of answering the question, why, why don't more producers build upgradability into their IoT? Mm -hmm. Like the, the company that made the, uh, the cameras that were the primary bots for the Mirai botnet, why didn't they include upgradability features in their, in their cameras? Why not? And uh, you know, just, I don't know if they're willing to talk about it, um, but uh, getting, getting some insight directly from that source, if you're able to make contact with them, that sort of thing. You know, hearing, hearing from them, what is it? Is it, is it technical? Is it a, a profit margin issue? Did they just not think about it before? And now, mm -hmm. you know, they, they, re they realize that it's, it's serious. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, I mean, I think that you'll find uh, different companies probably have different uh, perspectives on all of those, and you could probably make a full white paper just based on that. Mm -hmm. It's, it's almost like we have some people who are in the technology provision business <laughs> have some opinions on this. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's cost. It's real that simple. Is, it's cost. Yeah. Yeah. And I was just going to add, I, I bought one of those cameras. It, it was upgradable. It just didn't follow all the best practices on how to make it upgradable. It was very obscure, and, you know, you had to go download a piece of software from their site, download another software manager to download it to your camera. Mm -hmm. You had to do some jump through a bunch of hoops in your home network to find your camera. So, so this is, this is, and so this comes back, to, I, I want to respond to this because this is good. And so I think what you're asking and your answer, I think, uh, this gentleman's answer, I'm sorry for getting your name, Ralph, Ralph um, it, it's, it's what's underneath that interchange that I think we're trying to drive to, right? Um, so you're asking the right question, but your answer of cost is, is the right answer, but then what then is the incentive? How do we incentivize you by either making it more cost effective, that is reducing or lowering the barrier, or creating some other way for you to be able to offset the cost of introducing the, the, the upgradability, hopefully without having it go to being regulated, which is what right. we all want to try to avoid. Right. That was the dynamic that we were trying to capture, and you guys just sort of played it out in real time, which right. was great. So I, I think, but that's why I said, I think you know, if you look just at the consumer market, right, the dynamics there are, um, are pretty clear. Um, I think it's an example you can use and fairly easily use it as a use case and drive out what those incentives are. 
So cost is one. Another one is control. So the, these are conversations I've had with the manufacturers who say, hey, if you're going to automate this, I, I don't want updating my device to be under the control of some other manufacturer, mm -hmm. right? There's a, how do I control my destiny from that perspective? Um, and then there is my business model, which relates to cost, which is today my business model is one where I sell the product and I'm done with it, period. And the fact that I'm making it smart doesn't really change that business model. Mm -hmm. So there's fundamental business models that have to change to make it a sustainable product that says, hey, I have to build into my cost ongoing support for this device. Well, right. So you're, you're, you're getting at something that I would, I would uh, frame as breaking out cost, right? So if cost is really the big barrier to producers, including upgrade capability into their devices, what, what cost exactly, right? Like we have a Sri's working group came up with a, a long list of technical capabilities that are necessary in order to perform an update. Is it possible to quantify those? Sure. And to say, okay, these are the most expensive parts. Is it, is it hiring the security engineer who's gonna have to come up with the security update, uh, et cetera? And that, mm -hmm. that so might the, be So the most, com the the most common useful. cost that gets, gets raised to begin with is I have to, it, it costs me to put security in, right? So if I'm gonna support upgrade, I have to have twice the memory. If I'm gonna encrypt things, I've gotta have some ability to encrypt. That means I need to use a more expensive part, which means my product costs more, which means my competitor can undercut my price. So, oh, sorry. Justin, and then we'll go to uh, Kent on the phone. Okay, great. Um, so I, I have uh, just two points I want to talk about here. So one is a, uh, just some experience that we've had with convincing people to use update stuff that we've provided. So basically once we've, you know, so we go, we provide working implementation of it, we show people it works, we do a couple of example integrations, we show them, hey, this is how easy it is to go and get this going. And then usually once we get our first major adopter, then everybody else wants to play follow the leader. So um, that's, I think, a viable strategy for getting something into the market is actually build good tooling around it and have something that people can use out of the box. They don't have to invent. Because I think that in this discussion about costs and all this other stuff, I think they're the, you know, if, if I had been asked that question, I actually would have said first to market. Because first to market, getting that first mover advantage, getting your product out earlier, getting ahead of other people, at least in the very startup y Internet of Things devices, really makes a big difference for an established company, maybe not as much. But okay, so that was the first point I wanted to make. And then the second point I wanted to make that was brought up a couple times is um, I'm not so sure that, um, that IoT. Like, there's different ways to view IoT. You could view, uh, we should do updates for IoT. And, up, and IoT is, is everything under the sun that we can think of when it comes to IoT. Um, but I actually, from having worked, you know, in a lot of detail in the automotive space and worked in a little bit less detail, but having worked quite a bit with some folks in the medical space who understand that space very well, um, and, and worked a lot in the, in the kind of cloud server desktop space about updates, there, I think the domains are different enough and the constraints are different enough that if you tried to have a single set of guidelines or a single sort of operating environment or a single kind of description of what an updater is supposed to look like, I don't think it fits because medical isn't the same as automotive, isn't the same as IoT, isn't the same as an airplane. And I think that at some point trying to figure out, do we want to only collect the high level ideas that make sense in all those domains and fuzz over all the rest of it or is the intent to come out with more detailed specifications that describe at a lower level of detail for specific domains how they should, you know, our, our thoughts on how they should be doing. I think that's also a discussion that, that should be had because these are not, this isn't a one size fits all. No, so I think that, let me, let me react to that. I know we're gonna get close to time here, but just bear with me. Um, so basic, you know, in my mind, and so maybe this is a failing of me in terms of presentation, but everything you just said is sort of like the introduction to our white paper, right? It's why we took this path in the first place. It's a recognition of the fact that there's no way for any one group of people to, in a broad context like this to sit down and say, here's an incentive that will work for everyone. Here's a barrier that everyone has to knock down, um, which is why we took this approach. It was, can we generate something useful given what you just described, which is this is a highly nuanced, highly challenging area. Can we enable decision makers? So if I make medical devices, 
is there an approach I can take to get me started thinking about what, what is my risk? What are the reasons I can't upgrade my medical devices? They could be technological. They could be cost. What are the barriers? Now they can start to think about the fact, okay, now I've thought about it in this context. How do I make some changes, either internally or working with external parties, to now get to where I want to go? So I, I think you're, you're spot yeah, on. And, and just to... And, and so does that mean that the second, you know, working group and the first working group and everything should be siloed, but there should be some master working group that does it overall? Or you see what I'm saying? I well, mean, so this yeah. has come up before, right? And we've talked about, um, well, I, I, maybe you wanted to talk about it later, but Please. we have talked about how, how do we start to bring the groups together, right? Because we've been working largely independently. There's been some cross-pollinization just on an individual level, um, but it's been largely independent. And we, 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 there has been some discussion around, okay, now it's time to start bringing groups together. And I think, I'll be honest, some of the stuff I saw today from the other working groups, it's the first time I've seen it, right? So it got my sort of juices flowing around, oh, you know what, I see what Harley's talking about. I see what Ken is talking about. I see how that could interplay with what we've been talking about. So I think there's a logical next step there that gets to what you're saying. And we're going to go to Kent on the phone and then to Michael. Uh, you guys are now having an appreciation of why this working group has had some fantastic discussions, uh, <laughs> but is still sort of saying what we're doing is clearly important, uh, but how to actually move forward. You sort of get the tension that yeah. they've been working with. Uh, so Kent on the phone. Okay, so uh, John does what John normally does. He answers my questions quite often before I even ask them. <laughs> um, one of the things that uh, I do want to sort of, and the reason for the question in the first place was, it's, in some respects, it does come down to how we're going to package and deliver this. Um, from the standpoint of the intent of the effort is really to try to encourage the, uh, the manufacturers to uh, do the right things initially. Consumer areas are, are fine and useful, but the reality is if we don't, con if we don't convince the manufacturers that there's value in trying to go through this process, this understanding as to an evaluation as to, uh, you know, when does that cost become important to them, um, I, then I, I think we're, we're not accomplishing the mission. But if we can focus this in such a way as there is that kind of decision-making process that can be incorporated into a product development life cycle, does it matter? Is this so cheap that the consumer is going to throw it away if there's a problem? Is this something that is going to have a much longer life? Do we need to make the investments now to avoid the PR nightmares of being used as a, 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 in a DDoS attack and having our names scattered everywhere. Those types of, of decision-making process would be extremely valuable for organizations trying to go through this right now. They don't want to, we want, don't want them doing this on a gut basis. Um, we want them doing this on some sort of evaluated process that makes sense for them. And I think that the, you know, what I, what I see here is, is really good um, as that kind of basis, and we need to focus on the producers and convincing them to use a process similar to this. Thank you, Ken. Uh, it's a really good way of sort of framing this with John. John? Oh, I think he had okay. a, you Michael. said he could talk. Yes. <laughs> I, I think uh, as we consider the, the emergence of norms in this space, whether it's uh, industry best practices or voluntary standards or regulation or, heaven forbid, a statute, um, I think it's important to separate um, those events and risks and liabilities which are pre-existent in the, the uh, industrial product or uh, from those that are added by virtue of their connectivity to the network. You may be inducing a, an opportunity for a privacy violation or an incendiary overload of, of a, an electrical uh, panel uh, by the connectivity, but there's still a universe of pre-existing liabilities from the device overheating and blowing up its motor or, or going bad in some other way. And I, I think it's important to recognize that the norms need to account both for those things uh, that were there in the product before it became a connected device and part of an IoT device, as well as those that result from the fact of its connectivity. And again, I, I will say my read of you, your work is that it really bolsters the understanding of the additive risk associated with uh, becoming connected when the device has an, a pre-existing identity and a pre-existing uh, legacy of, of known faults and errors and, and liabilities that might be associated with it. That's great.
great. Thank you. So I'll, I'll, I'll wrap it up. So um, this is exactly what I wanted to hear today. So thank you for that, right? I mean, I mentioned right off the top that our group has been very engaged, but we've been missing a couple of key voices. Um, and so, you know, I got to hear from a couple of people I would classify as producers today. And I want to encourage those folks, whether the ones here in the room or others, to, to kind of jump into our working group for a little bit and help us to frame out these things in more real terms. Right? We think we've got an approximation of reality, but what I've heard today is that we need to get more real. We need more use cases, not a ton of use cases, so we need to think about how do we scope what the use case really is, but we need a few more that are more concrete, right? that can actually be more informative around here's how it has actually played out. So I just, again, uh, you've heard this from every working group. Um, you'll hear it again from Alan, I'm sure, but we want to encourage you, if you're interested, let us know. You don't have to come to every meeting. <laughs> right? Just, just come to one or two, share your perspective, help us to get that voice into the mix so that um, we can continue our progress. So, thanks. Thank you, John. And, uh, and thanks to everyone who took part in this working group. Uh, as I said, I've been able to listen to most of the conversations. They've been fantastic, uh, but they've all sort of been wrestling with this very large society-wide issue. Uh, they certainly carved off a fun chunk for themselves. So now we're going to have a broader discussion. We've sort of heard from all four working groups, and we want to have a discussion of where we are and where we're going to be going. And there are a couple of different components I see to this, but feel free to jump in uh, as we go on. Uh, one is just the outcomes. So we are in different stages. Uh, I think everyone has a clear trajectory, but where they are along that vector varies. Uh, the communications group has a draft. Uh, and they're clearly looking for feedback so they can actually get it out. Uh, whereas, you know, the incentives and barriers group has said, okay, we've got a vague idea, now we just need to sort of make sure we're in the right direction, great, we're going to go forward. So how do we want these to actually go forward and then come out to the world? Do we want one document? Do we want four separate documents? Should there be an overarching document? Do we want cross-referencing? And then, equally important, once we have these documents out in the world, how do we make sure this isn't just a throw it over the wall and assume that everyone knows NTIA and the Federal Register so well that they will obviously read it? How do we make sure they actually have the impact that we want that we've been doing all this work for the last few months on? The other thing I want to put on the agenda this afternoon is from a stakeholder perspective, we have this odd problem, which is how do we as the folks in the room identify the folks who aren't in the room that really need to be part of this conversation in order to make sure that the outcomes really reflect the entire community and also have the legitimacy that comes from having consulted the entire ecosystem. So who are the folks that we should be engaging? What are the four that we should be engaging? I know a number of you have come here today to sort of be able to have a, a little bit of mention of the work that you're doing that is quite closely related to the problem and the challenges around software updatability in IoT. Uh, so I want to make sure that we have some time for that. But first, let's have uh, some, we'll sort of first chime in and get some thoughts and opinions on the outcomes of what we're going to be doing. How do we want to take the work we're doing and actually aim towards the finish line? Alan? Yes. I actually, it might be helpful to just kind of, you know, what does success look like? Um, and, um, you know, what are the metrics? For example, I'm just so we've worked on other NTIA working group efforts in the past. Do you measure unique downloads? What is the measurement of success even in the past that we should be thinking about? Um, what capabilities are there? I think that would be good. I think the other point is it's not only this working group, but I mentioned earlier in the week about the efforts of other U.S. government agencies. And I think that's another area to be thinking about. How do we reconcile those things together, not just not just the efforts of this group, but there's other parallel efforts. And what is the role of NTIA in those areas? So I just wanted to push those out as we think about going forward. Well, so to, to, to sort of address your, your more immediate questions, I can say that uh, from an NTIA perspective, we are the facilitator. Uh, we are not looking to measure or build metrics around success. Our job, as I like to say, is we push, but the steering has to come from the community, has to be something the community wants. And what we want to do is be able to identify what are the catalytic measures we can take 
to say the work that we're doing, which has taken a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of skull sweat, how do we actually get it out into the world in such a way that has a meaningful impact? Uh, and in terms of the broader government discussion, this initiative has never been, in fact, it is illegal to uh, have a group like this and have it talk about other direct government policy. Uh, that would break the FACA barrier. Uh, but what we want to do is make sure that we, the work that we're doing here uh, can be useful to our government colleagues and also uh, the NTI editorializing uh, sort of demonstrate the value of community and industry-led initiatives as a, a path forward for this kind of problem. Uh, so, Michael Van Hoff. Well, it occurs to me that there, are, and this may also go to who's not here, but there are a couple of bodies that have recurring uh, publications uh, that articulate uh, some of this at a national policy level. Uh, there's a triennial national standards policy document that is written uh, in uh, partnership between the Commerce Department and the voluntary standards community. ANSI usually holds a pen for it. Uh, I would suggest that that's a an interesting place to consider going. Uh, the, the table of contents of, of the standards catalog has 15 or 20 voluntary standards bodies uh, who perhaps uh, ought to be uh, convening with uh, this group or some variant of this group, or at least at, uh, polled for their uh, collective consensus view of, of how do they think things might roll out in, in their individual spaces. And then your, your, your colleagues within the White House and the, in the Office of Technology uh, policy uh, uh, are going to produce a, a national technology uh, annual that clearly should have some uh, reference to IoT in it, and maybe that should reflect uh, some of the consensus emerging out of these working groups. Uh, Harley, and uh, you have a two finger. Uh, Harley, then no. So, um, first on the final form that this work may take, and then second on metrics. Um, I think that the work of the different working groups is each valuable uh, as a standalone document, but could also be then integrated into a larger whole. So I think that the, uh, the target audience for a collection, a, a compendium of the standards, for example, is going to be different than the uh, the target audience for uh, communicating the elements of IoT upgradability. Um, and I think that it would make more sense for each of these working group outputs to be matured individually so that you can send them out to those target audiences rather than handing them kind of a larger white paper that everybody has to dig through and that may not uh, contain the specific information that they want. Now that being said, uh, I think that you can also have a an additional document that weaves these different outputs together. And uh, whether or not you know, so we, we are willing to take that on and what form that might look like, I'm not sure. And I'm not, I'm not sure that we're going to know until each of the working groups uh, has, uh, like their, their work product is, is matured enough to, to stand alone. But I do think that each one adds unique value uh, in and of itself. And, uh, and, and so I guess I would, I would envision a final work product looking like the uh, four working groups, documents, and then perhaps something that, uh, that, that synthesizes them all. Uh, or, or perhaps not the thing that synthesizes them all. You just have the four working group documents, and that is the output. Um, in terms of metrics, I also think that the, uh, the metrics for each of the working groups output is going to be different. Um, so for example, to use the same, uh, the same two working groups, uh, the metrics for the uh, a body of uh, standards, uh, you know, the, the, the compendium of standards, uh, very valuable, but I'm not sure how you measure that, perhaps downloads. But if I'm going to measure the output of our working group, the, the, the success of our working group, it's going to be adoption. It's going to be whether or not producers actually decide to communicate these things to consumers. So it's very different than, I think, some of the metrics for success for some of the other working groups, uh, which, again, goes to my point of each one adds unique value alone. It'll be difficult to just mash them all together. I think that all four of them should mature, and then we decide what to do. Great. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thoughts, John? Than that. Yeah, so um, I, I Harley said a big part of what I was going to say, so I'll just reinforce it. I, I do like the idea of the synthesis document, um, even at a conceptual level, because I think it will force us to understand what we're missing. 
you know, when right now, because we're operating largely in four silos, which I, again is appropriate for this part of the process, um, I think we, there, there may be areas that are not being addressed because of the approach that we've taken. An effort to synthesize the four outcomes, um, not to necessarily merge them, but to sort of synthesize the concept and see how they fit together, might, might put this group in a position to say, oh crap, we forgot about this other thing, or now we see how this fits into a bigger picture. So this reinforced, I think that's a good idea. The other thing, and, and this may be more tactical, is I do think um, um, we do need to figure out how to take advantage of the, the multi-sector nature of this uh, and find the right ways to do multi-sector communication, right? I mean, we're doing a panel on this subject, and it's four security guys at a security conference. Okay, that's great, and that's fine, but that, that, like, so what? That's not enough, right? We need to find events where you can have a security person and a manufacturer and a policy person and somebody else who are sort of on a panel together talking about this issue, maybe not at a cybersecurity conference, right? Maybe it's some other type of an event, and I don't know what sort of events, you know, cable box manufacturers have, but maybe there's an opportunity to kind of reach out to those types of places and spread the message around to audiences that aren't used to hearing it in the same way that the cybersecurity community is used to hearing it. Fantastic. I want to make sure that we get time to talk about the different events and venues. Uh, but before I want to focus, continue this conversation about separate documents, single documents, how, how that potential is going to be. Matt, then Trina. Uh, Alan, thanks. Uh, first, John, thanks for the work on the... Uh, and Matt, remind us who you are. Oh, yeah. Uh, Matthew with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Uh, th John, thanks for the work on the incentives and barriers. Uh, that's uh, a very... Um, hard thing to put together uh, well. Um, just wanted to offer the thought that I think based on experience with a, a number of members, um, that I think a single document compiling all the different efforts might be your best uh, way to proceed. Something that combines a little bit of uh, simple uh, messages in terms of what you're trying to communicate so you're engaging both the, uh, <laughs> the new audiences um, as well as the experienced hands uh, as well as maybe some granularity, maybe not as much as the uh, cyber physical systems document uh, that, that NIST put together. But I think some combination of both tends to work uh, well. And then in terms of how do we gauge use, um, I think if anything the, the NIST framework effort uh, at least instructs us that uh, trying to gauge metrics use is, uh, is a tough road to get down. Um, I think we all like the scientific method, but what policymakers want to do with metrics can often be something that we don't want. But anyway, just a word of caution. I am going to let my NIST colleagues spend their time talking about the NIST framework metrics issue. Uh, we'll leave that outside of this particular discussion. Sure not then, Michael. Uh, I just wanted to add one more stakeholder community that you might be interested to, to add to the extent they're not already here, and they may be, and I'm simply unaware of it, but uh, the, the uh, state attorneys general have, through their Washington office, a technology expertise, and I think they would be uh, very interested in letting folks know uh, where the demands are percolating up uh, from the, the, the sub-federal level, and also uh, hear what the uh, various directions of this has taken uh, take them into the, their technology conference a couple of weeks ago in uh, Charlottesville really had a, an, an IOT was probably the most frequently mentioned phrase at the conference. Thank you. Trina. Yeah, uh, I, I, come, I agree with uh, Mac on the having a single document kind of stuff. Uh, with giving in, uh, in the initially giving some inter introduction, overview kind of a thing, what we are trying to address in the whole document, and then put together all four work groups in this one. And also then, as I mentioned earlier, the use case and the test case studies, implementation, that's more key to this. How do you implement in different scenarios? Um, like as you said, the same update has to be done to your refrigerator in a this environment and a this environment, that's a different. Uh, this one. So those kind of a case studies needs to be shown in that document that becomes more uh, valuable than just putting the words. Craig, then hi. Yeah, I, um, I know it's a little harder to have one document, but from our own experience of having documents that reference others, and, and I know you may not like metrics, but when we see only 10% of people that go actually download the other document, we see there's a disconnect and they're both really important. So I, I think it's almost kind of like the the life cycle, what we're trying to do, or how they all kind of couple together, um, need to be ideally in a single document. If not, then each document needs to say kind of like chapter two, you need to go here. It needs to be really prominently 
uh, make it very clear that this is only you know, part one of, of four parts or five parts of the working group. Because a, a fear is people pick up one document and the point of reference is we launched our IoT framework that had the must-do principles and then we had recommended principles and the recommended principles was a separate document. You know, and we had like 18,000 downloads of the main document and less than 600 of the must-dos. And it's people because they weren't aware of it. They got the one document and then they went off on that. So our own experience. So in this area that there's a lot of really good parts here, but if it's not one part document, I think we're going to really limit the overall goal of having a good solution for everyone. So thank you. Uh, Harley and then Claude. So uh, on the phone. I want to advocate for both. Right? I don't think that it's either or, that you have uh, broken up documents versus one document. I think that you can have both documents that stand alone and be individual files and a single document that weaves them all together. And I think that that is the way that you get the maximum utility out of each of the chapters. And it will also, uh, it'll also make it easier to, uh, to target, as I said. Uh, which I think that it is, is actually hugely important. Uh, you know, sending, sending a white paper to a, a, a body that I know is only interested in part of the document uh, will be, uh, and then pointing them to the particular chapter in the larger white paper, which will, by the way, have to wait until uh, all of the four uh, working groups, like all of their work products are completely mature. Uh, it seems to me to be unnecessary. And I think that we can do both. Um, so just putting that out there again, uh, one document would be, would, would be fine. I think having the four standalone as, as an additional uh, vehicle is also important. All right, thank you. Uh, trying to have both, both aspects seems to make sense, but we'll, uh, we've got Claude on the phone. Hi there, can you hear me? We can indeed. Thanks for joining right. the call. Hey, hey, Alan, hello everyone. My name is Claude Baudouin, and I'm an advisor to the Industrial uh, Internet Consortium uh, in particular, not, not exclusively. Uh, I like what Harley said a lot about the composition of the deliverable. I just want to say that um, the Industrial Internet uh, Consortium, I see, did face exactly the same problem. And just as, a, as an indication, of, I'm not saying that it is the solution, but the way they handled it was to create a sort of uh, super table of content up front, which is sort of a document architecture, if you wish, for in a complete book of knowledge on, uh, in their case, the industrial IoT, and then to name the volumes of that overall book of knowledge, uh, giving them uh, letters and numbers. You know, there's G1, 2, 3, 4 for the general volumes, and then T1, 2, 3, 4 for technical things. And then the deliverables can be developed asynchronously. So uh, the uh, reference architecture was, I don't know, G2 or G4, I can't remember, uh, et cetera. So that gives the ability for each of the contributing bodies, in, in this case the working groups, to go at their own pace and complete their documents when they can, but it provides visibility up front about what is going to be the overall structure of the document. So when you see the title and you see that it's volume G2, um, it sort of hints to you as a reader that maybe you should look at the whole table of content and find what's in G1 and G3. Um, so it does require advanced thinking about the architecture of the uh, overall compilation or compendium of, of deliverables, but then it uh, leaves each working group in, uh, uh, in control of its space and its, uh, its scope. So that's just an idea. Thank you, Claude. I appreciate that. We've got a two-finger from Harley. Uh, so I'm glad that Claude made that point, and I intended to make it in and forgot to make it in my last comment, which was that even in standalone documents, I think that it is appropriate for each of those standalone documents to reference that it is part of a larger whole. Uh, so that should be explicit. A person reading a standalone document should not get the impression that that was the entirety of the output of the multi-stakeholder process. Um, just that they're downloading one chapter of the multi-stakeholder process and they also have the option of downloading all of the work product. Any strong thoughts or, you know, seem to hear a vision saying, okay, we like the idea of having the work streams continue. We want to correlate them together. So having individually addressable uh, documents that can be freestanding but still are clearly part of a whole. Do we like that general vision? Which probably means at some point 
I'm going to be asking for folks who want to do that preface, just as a heads up, I'm going to be coming looking for folks who can sit down and actually have that preface that can be so broadly addressable, cleanly written, and describe what's in the overall community. So just letting you know that that's something that's going to happen. Uh, now, one of the things when we talk about these outcomes is first they'll, you know, NTIA I think is happy to sort of be the host, the pointer of these documents. But there is also the alternative for other organizations to say, hey, the work you've done, either all or part, this is great. We have a long-term standing mission to do this. We're happy to take what you have and build on it. And so one of the things I always like to make sure is, are there folks who sort of think that this might fit in some other organization that is happy to sort of take the work that we've done, continue the spirit of multi-stakeholderism, but continue to build on it? Continue to build is okay without doing the modification to the existing one. That's yes, a good, that's, that's a very good preface that you yes. know, say we want to modify, we want to build on it, but we don't want to change and erase certain points. Any thoughts on that? Uh, Kent, I see we have a comment from Kent on the phone. Actually, I, I um, first off, I agree with Harley. I think they were, we can have it both ways. We do need sort of a holistic approach to uh, this document, the question, or this effort. Um, the question is, um, you know, from the standpoint of a lot of these um, going forward, we need sort of an established mechanism to get it out. Um, personally, I think uh, NIST is a great place to try to get some of this stuff out. If we can get them to sort of accept the work like they've done in other areas in the past. Um, I, I've been on other efforts where we have come to NIST with specifics uh, about an effort that they then turned into an SP. Uh, I, I, this is one area that it might be beneficial for commerce to work together to actually get this kind of uh, outcome out. And uh, within there, they can have references to external documents, which could be, in some respects, the full-blown kind of uh, each working group's output. That's a fun idea. And certainly for this initiative, I'd be willing to go out to Gaithersburg. <laughs> it's far. Any thoughts on uh, this sort of long-term development? Yes. Hi. My name is Amanda, uh, formerly OMB, but currently here as an individual. I just had a question in terms of structure. So typically in the past, if you could elaborate on what the process has been before when you reach the end of uh, a working group and what the communication looks like. From what I've heard today, it doesn't sound like you have a communications group per se within the working group or a marketing uh, you know, person to go to. So I'm just curious what that looks like and if you could elaborate on that if you're looking for volunteers for that too. Uh, so the joy of the NTIA approach is that every topic is different and they really are led by stakeholders. Uh, the role that MTIA has played is to help work with stakeholders to achieve the impact they want, whether it is purely awareness raising, whether it is adoption, whether it is pushing this into other more formal processes uh, for, for even greater adoption. Uh, that is really up to you as a community, uh, and we're happy to help in any way possible. Um, we, have, we are a small agency. We don't have a massive budget. Uh, you know, reasonably respected, but uh, sort of from that point, we have to rely on you, know, you, the stakeholders, to say, hey, we can do this. And for example, we want to submit a talk to this conference where this is an audience that will be really receptive. Let's bring some stakeholders together, or let's work with this trade association, this industry group, things like that. We would love your help. We're very happy that you're here. Craig. Alan, better in a bit of these processes. Alan, um, I'm going to challenge that just because that's the way it's been done before, and um, I suggest that NTIA rethink that because, again, whether it was the facial recognition, whether it was the mobile, other ones, um, after the last working group, uh, it really didn't see the light of day. And so I think to depend upon everyone has put their time, I think that is the role of NTIA is to then help amplify that effort. And so... Um, to rethink that, I really challenge that, and you know, I know you're waiting for a, a new head, 
um, and a lot of things are up in the air, but that would be a role, and especially in this administration that wants to see um, self-regulation uh, succeed, I think that would be an important role for NTIA to put resources behind that, get that out there. So that would be my firm recommendation to NTIA. Thank you, I so. really appreciate that. We'll take that under very strong advisement, and I would argue <laughs> that even when there are organizations that can devote lots of resources to that, for example, the NIST framework, uh, a lot of the heavy lifting, apart from having folks from NIST out in the world, was having really strong buy-in from private sector leaders, such as the Chamber of Commerce, who could say, listen, we can take this out uh, and really work with this. One of the reasons why, by the way, that we started this discussion uh, by having an event uh, co-located with the Consumer Technology Association uh, is because we wanted to make sure that we had some engagement uh, from industry from the start. John. Uh. Well, all right, I say what I was going to say. I thought maybe I would. But so I want to second what Craig said, first of all, right? I think th this, as we have all learned and continue to learn, this is a complex issue that intersects a lot of different things. I understand that from NTIA's perspective, it can be complicated to be the champion. Um, but and, and maybe it's not just NTIA. Maybe it is some combination of NTIA and NIST or, or something else. But I, my personal opinion is we do need some solid government leadership um, around this issue for some time yet, right? I mean, part of the NIST model has always been, and the reason it's been successful is that NIST has gotten pretty good at knowing when it's time to stop shepherding something and give it up. And this issue is not ready to be given up. And so to the extent that, that NTIA or NIST or whoever is going to continue to play a role, I think that role needs to be proactive. And I, I think it needs, it does need to be a leadership role until it becomes clear that industry is capable of taking this and, and moving it on on its own. Great. Thank you. I think that's a great segue to talk about some of the related initiatives that some of you are interested in, in talking a little bit about. I know, Michael, perhaps we can talk about uh, the event that you have coming up that might be a good opportunity to discuss this, and I know there are a few others who are interested in mentioning this. Uh, I think, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm uh, the chairman of the American Bar Association's Information Security Committee. Uh, which is part of its section on science and technology law, uh, coming up on uh, May 10th and 11th here in Washington. And um, I've, I've got enough uh, of these uh, little brochures to pass out to everybody. Uh, we have a, uh, the second annual uh, National Institute on IoT coming up. It'll be held at the offices of Jones Day on Capitol Hill. A uh, two-day event uh, among the speakers are, are going to be um, uh, Anne-Marie Burkle, the uh, acting chairwoman of the CPSC, uh, Raj Day, the former general counsel of NSA, uh, Sean Race, who's the attorney general of, of Utah. Uh, there's going to be a, uh, a mock trial on uh, exposing some of the issues in IoT liability, as well as a tabletop exercise looking at the various potential directions for uh, norms and regulation development. Uh, so we, we expect it to be interesting. It is not free. Uh, uh, the uh, ABA website has all the information and the link to that is uh, printed on this document, which I'll share. I have enough to share with everybody. Thanks. Uh, Michael, how do you envision this work integrating with the event you just described? It sounds like you have an agenda and speakers already all lined up. Yes, but uh, certainly any attendee would be free during, uh, and there are several panels uh, uh, addressing issues like norms and standards uh, where uh, questions from the floor will be entertained and those that reference uh, uh, this work uh, uh, clearly be, uh, be interesting and appropriate. I'm going to be moderating a panel uh, on the, uh, the development of, of norms uh, coming from government sources with uh, uh, Bob Metzger uh, and Bob Martin from the Industrial Internet uh, Consortium and uh, Andrew Zakel from IBM Federal, uh, which uh, looking to the future of... Uh, you should think about putting someone from the government on that panel, you know? Well, I may, I may, may, may also suggest, though, that uh, if we're going to really make a push for adoption and uh, popularization of this work, then we are going to need something uh, beyond bringing it up in a question at the end of a panel. I mean, we've all been on panels where those, those things get brought up and then no one, you know, no, no one actually downloads the document or maybe, maybe one person does. I mean, this is sort of a panel in and of itself uh, you know, or, or, a, or a presentation in and of itself. Well, I, I can certainly make the commitment that when I, in the panel that I'm going to be moderating, I'll certainly make reference to, to this initiative. Uh, but uh, 
I, I'm a newcomer here. Many of you have a, have a sunk investment in the, the working groups. Uh, uh, plus, I, I would suggest that there will be great benefit of uh, engagement and exposure with uh, uh, the variety of, uh, of individuals who will be attending from a, a range of government and uh, professional bar and, and practitioner sources. Eric Hibbard, uh, the uh, uh, one of the U.S. officers of uh, Hitachi Data Systems happens to, be, even though he's not an attorney, is, a, is an officer of, of the uh, ABA Internet of Things Committee, and he's going to be one of the conveners. So there'll be a lot of interesting folks there to engage. Well, I, I know Perhaps that. Perhaps a bigger picture, which maybe we can talk about offline, is if the ABA thinks that this is a good direction to head in, uh, how can this community as a whole engage with the ABA, uh, which clearly has uh, been driving, you know, in-house counsels, risk officers, things like that. I think One of the things I can make an immediate commitment to right now is that we'd be happy to, to do a, an online webinar uh, with a panel from the, this community to expose uh, the, uh, the, the work uh, as it currently exists to, uh, to the ABA community. As well, as well as building it into the agenda of future events, I think that would be really awesome. Yeah. And I think that would also be a great way of getting uh, some input from lawyers, both who are part of these organizations and who are represent uh, parties at risk to sort of say, hey, this is going on, let's contribute. So thank you, I appreciate that. Um, Jason on the phone, we see we're gonna get to you in a second. I just wanna make sure, is there anyone else who sort of wants to talk about a sort of related forum that might be, or, or engagement that we should, that this body should be aware of? Yeah, Ralph. Yeah, this is Ralph Brown. I just raised the Open Connectivity Foundation, or OCF, which is very active. One of the larger um, consortium around IoT, currently focused around smart home or consumer-focused IoT. Um, Cable Labs has been an active participant there. I sit on the board. We chair the security working group there. Um, so, so we think there's merit in trying to establish standards in this area um, that are interoperable. Um, broadly adopted, multiple suppliers participating. Um, and one of the things that I would like to do is take some of the output of this work here um, and promote it through that organization because I think um, awareness of that organization of, of the interest uh, from NTIA would be, would be beneficial. So. That would be fantastic. And I think also similarly if there are folks in that initiative uh, who would want to weigh in, uh, I think one of the things we've learned is that Serious security people have sort of taken a look at the work that's going on and said, oh, we should hear some input that you guys should have as part of these discussions. So that would be very useful. Craig. You know, um, it might be premature. Obviously, the documents are still pretty rough, and we're moving things around there. But I think at some future state, I could see if we really want this group to be ambassadors effectively, um, would also perhaps be a deliverable of a, of a core deck or so that could be used so people could go, because we all have our worlds that we go into, uh, whether, um, you know, that we have an opportunity to present it. So having that as a resource uh, that NTIA could create for that, that would be, I think, helpful um, as we look forward. So we first have to get the core documents done, right. and then there, but as we think about that. I think that'd be useful, especially if one of the working groups is starting to wrap up their work, they'll have some spare time. Right, Harlan? It's the, uh, <laughs> Uh, so on the phone, I have uh, Jason and then Claude. Senior line is open. Hey, Jason. Hey, hey, thanks. Um, yeah, so I, uh, I wanted to sort of bring up what you had said before and then segue into the, you know, the broadband forum stuff just really quickly. Just because, so one of the things, you know, when I, when I started getting involved in this, I was always trying to put the hat on of like, hey, you know, how is this going to be useful to me and to us? And so I've been actually trying to take the, you know, kind of work in a kind of a more agile way rather than, you know, waiting for everything to be finished and kind of, I've been regularly feeding back what's been happening in, uh, in working group two specifically uh, to the design of the things that we're trying to do uh, to, to enable IoT upgradeability with really any connect, connected device upgradeability because what happened in the forum is, you know, about 12 years ago, we had to solve very, very similar use cases for, uh, for home gateways and other CPE like uh, set-top boxes and VoIP devices and, and such. And so the, the mechanisms 
in that protocol, um, you know, we're kind of vetted for doing remote upgrades and keeping up with it. Scalability was a huge, huge uh, issue that we ended up solving. Um, and so we've taken those concepts and we're moving it into a kind of a new revolution of that protocol that is specifically tar targeted towards consumer electronics and, uh, you know, and, and revamping some of the old things. But we're working on that now, um, and it's called the User Services mm -hmm. Platform. And uh, it's, uh, we're, we're right. pressing forward pretty quickly. Thank you. Is this, is this an open platform? It, there will be peace. It's, it's, the forum is in kind of a, a state where it's changing the way that it does things. It is, it traditionally develops specifications, you know, completed specifications after it's been vetted for a long time just by the membership and people who have to be, have to be members in order to be involved in all that. But that, all that is kind of changing. So there will be pieces of it that uh, I expect that the form will help produce that are, you know, pieces of open source software that can be used probably for the more complicated pieces of it. Um, and then, you know, the rest will be, will be designed by vendors according to the specification. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Claude, we've got you on the uh, phone. Yes, sir. Um, so I, I recognize that the industrial IoT is uh, in some ways a different beast, but in terms of how uh, the work that you are spearheading could, could flow into what we're doing and receive some, uh, some promotion or some usage, uh, the security framework that was published by the IIC in uh, January or February has a short section on upgrading and patching, so it wasn't ignored, but it's very short. It's about half a page, which we did use in Working Group 1, uh, to, and it's in the mentioned in the current draft catalog. But it's a good, it's a great hook to, to leverage the work of uh, this uh, multi-stakeholder process and adapt it uh, to for the, the use of industrial stakeholders. And I can't commit to the result of that process, but I can commit to put this in front of our uh, security working group. And uh, I may be able to do that as soon as our next meeting, which is in Berlin in mid-June, um, so in, in uh, less than two months, and then see what the whether the security working group thinks that uh, it could uh, either mm -hmm. r revise its uh, paper by adding more stuff on upgrading and patching, leveraging this work, or whether mm -hmm. it actually wants to issue a, a separate uh, report, which might be a subset of the NTIA report, oh. adapted to industrial um, players. So uh, there's definitely an avenue there to connect this work with the IIC work on security and make it relevant to the industrial internet world. Thank you. I appreciate that. And you said the magic word about next meeting. But before we get there, uh, Srinath? Yeah, I just want to add what he said. Uh, in the security frameworking group, uh, we are extending that framework document by adding different use cases and uh, test case studies and all those stuff. And one of the use cases, uh, update, secure update, is uh, one of the topics. So that's it's coming up there, too. So yes, what we are developing here can be uh, taken there and uh, harmonize it. Yeah, possible. Thanks. All right. Further thoughts on community building, either people we need to bring in or places we need to go out to? Well, just, just, just maybe this is more generically, but um, we've already, there's been a group of us that have been um, doing some planning around carrying this message to cybersecurity events. Um, I would like to have, you know, if you work in the cybersecurity space or, or you like to ten, attend um, any of the major cybersecurity events or even some of the less major ones, and you'd be interested in being in a panel about this topic, please let me know. Um, there's four of us right now. We can't do all of them. <laughs> um, but, you know, I'm happy to, to help share the materials that we've put together already. And so, again, if you're going to be at a cybersecurity event, you know, in the coming several months, whatever it is, and you'd be willing to be on a, a panel about this subject, please let me know. Because I think the more people we can have sharing some of this messaging, to your point, I think the better off we'll be. Oh, yeah. thank you. I'll also add to that, I've spoken at uh, events for many of the people in this room, uh, and I'm already consuming way, way, way too much of my office's travel budget, 
Uh, but if there are events that you're engaged in from your community where I can help be an advocate or uh, at least you know, be pathetic enough that people will say, oh, we'll help them out, uh, let me know. I'm very good at being pathetic in public. Uh, and, and we can actually make some progress. Does it, uh, it's certainly not too early, even though it's only April. The call for speakers will probably come out in June or July, but uh, it's probably not too early to think about RSA 2018. <laughs> God. I'm still recovering. Yeah. I, I think, you know, we actually spoke at RSA, many on this here. I, I think if we're really trying to get back to our core audience that we talked about before, where are the device manufacturers going? They're not necessarily going to RSA as much as we all live there. You know, well, that's exactly, and some of us also spoke at CES, so be thinking about that engaging, and I'm not sure if um, anyone from uh, CTA is here today. I don't think so, but uh, we've been talking with They're them. On the line. Um, but that's a core area, so thinking outside the box. They aren't necessarily security-focused companies. Um, maybe it's the National Retail Federation, their events, shop.org, other areas that they go to, uh, internet retail or conference. So be thinking about those types of venues. If that's, that's to get beyond the choir. NRF was on the line earlier. Yes. Uh, Adir and I are from representing SMRP, and we'll be talking with you tomorrow, and obviously 5,000 members, you know, that, that are in the world of applying these and devices. Can you make sure everyone in the room knows what SMRP is? Uh, Society of Maintenance and Reliability Professionals. It covers up <laughs> the world yes. of, of industries. And uh, look forward to talking with you tomorrow. Fantastic. All right, this is pretty good. I think we've hit most of the items on the agenda. One of the things we want to talk about is next steps. How do we make progress? Uh, and one of the things that NTIA heard from you uh, from the initial get-go is frequent meetings are good, frequent travel is bad. Uh, and so we did a first, uh, at the very end of January, beginning of February, we had a virtual meeting. Uh, which was a first for us. I think it worked reasonably well. Uh, sense of the room, would you like the next meeting to be a virtual meeting? I realize we have a biased sample here because a lot of you are based in DC. I want to say, is there anyone on the phone who wants to chime in enthusiastically, either in favor of traveling someplace or having a virtual meeting? Virtual meeting. Virtual meeting, says the gentleman from New York. Harley? Virtual meeting. Virtual meeting. Okay. So the question for those of you who are involved in the working groups is six weeks. Is that a good time frame? Six weeks from now? I think we'll have made some substantial progress that we can come together. Do you need more time? Can you make it happen in less time? So eight weeks might put us into the middle of the summer, which is where I'm a little worried about. Yes. I'm sorry? Okay. Okay. Towards the end of June, middle to the end of June. Yeah. Craig, your light is on, but uh, that could have been oversight. Great. Well, um, I'm just actually looking at the Consumer Technology Association site. We might want to look at whether it's a next meeting or some other come up to a year. It was a year ago, Austin, that we pulled that together. But we you should be thinking about that. And, it, and that made some drive, some milestones there. So. And in fact, that relates to the next uh, thing that I was going to say is in terms of we want to actually get some planning on the calendar. One of the challenges we have and the government is it takes a little while to schedule a meeting and to get all the contracts and have this fantastic camera crew and this great space for you. It turns out it takes many, many weeks. Uh, so uh, if we wanted to start planning for an early fall meeting, uh, the question I have for you is can we build on an existing community, whether it is what happened last fall, trying to co-locate with a Consumer Technology Association, uh, or are there other events where you think we will have a great uh, a critical mass of folks who can be involved, or at very least where a lot of you will be? So does anyone know that they're going to be in a room with at least one or two others of you in early fall? Well, so the, the default to have an event is in Washington uh, because it saves you, the taxpayer, a little bit of money. 
Uh, but on the other hand, uh, if, and I know that a lot of you uh, are here in Washington, try to save people from getting on a plane. On the other hand, if people are going to be uh, co-located or if there's a constituency we really want to get, then I think it might make sense to entertain having a meeting uh, co-located outside of Washington. I'm not sure if this is one of these issues where we say we absolutely need to go to Silicon Valley uh, for legitimacy. I think this might be something that is, is truly diffuse enough uh, that wherever we have a meeting, we're going to have it. So in the last uh, process we had, we did one in California, and the Washington folks complained. We did one in Washington, and uh, the California folks complained. So we did it in Chicago, and then everyone complained, uh, which at least felt more fair. So we'll look around and try to find a date uh, in early fall. Uh, and I think for those of you who are inv involved in, in, in building this out, um, we want to have in the back of our mind that that might be a great time to actually have the, this is it, this is what we have, and now how do we get out into the wide world type of event. Uh, it might be six weeks from now that we'll actually be close to that point. But we really want to sort of have this simultaneous mission of one, really drill down on the work we have in front of us, but two, keep in the back of our mind the work we're going to have to do once we have documents to make sure they have the impact we want. Any further thoughts? I'd hate to end early and give you time back on this lovely we afternoon. We do have two questions on the phone. Oh, thank you for, uh, thank you for chiming in, uh, <coughs> Angela. We really appreciate that. We've got Kent and then Claude. Okay, from my perspective, um, you know, having it at the end of June is much better than the middle of June since uh, we're already doing a presentation uh, at first about this, which might be in the middle of conflicting. Um, if we're going to have meeting uh, in the fall, we really should try to uh, associate it with one of the targets that are outside the cybersecurity space. Um, we kicked it off that way, and I think we should, we should do that. Maybe not the same group, maybe a different group. But doing that, I think, uh, gets more people that could use it into the room. Great. Thank you. It's a, we'll, we'll continue to work on that. And hopefully, you as a community can sort of think about good stakeholders that we should be working with and reaching out to and, and stakeholder core communities. And Kent, I assume you're OK with a virtual meeting? Yeah, absolutely. Um, virtual meeting is just fine. All right. And Claude? I wanted to say the second, week, the second half of June is, uh, is better than earlier for the simple reason that the IIC is meeting uh, in Berlin the week of June 12th, so it would be good if it was right after that. The OMG is also meeting the, the week of June 5th, so, uh, so that, that I like that, that schedule either the week of June 29th or the week of June 26th. In terms of September, I can just offer to uh, advocate potentially to co-locate with the object management group meeting in New Orleans the week of the 25th, that may be a little bit later in September than you wanted, but um, there would be a lot of people involved in security of real-time uh, IoT protocols at that meeting, so that might be interesting. It's uh, the week of uh, the 25th to the 28th of uh, September in New Orleans. Thank you. That's, uh, that could be some promise. We'll, we'll have to talk about that. All right, I love it when we actually get such wonderful emerging consensus. Usually it's just half the group can't make the early June, half the group can't make later June. This is great. You solved the problem. We're going for late June uh, for the next meeting, which means that those of you who have been involved in the working groups, uh, we have some deadlines. Those of you who haven't, this is great. We get to pick working groups and join and roll up our sleeves and, and really get some work done. Um, we're going to send out an email uh, probably tomorrow uh, with the notes from today. Uh, they'll be sort of the raw, unedited notes that the fantastic Megan, who, by the way, has been doing security for a lot longer than I have uh, and, and is just fantastic and really is just helping us out immeasurably by documenting this discussion. Uh, but she actually is, uh, you know, our, our cybersecurity national security expert in the office, and, and we all owe her 
Thanks. Uh, so we'll send out some notes. Uh, what I will do is for each working group, we'll make sure the presentations get sent out. And for each working group, we're going to have one ask that we're going to send out to all 500 people that get these emails, saying here is the one ask for this working group with a point of contact so that we can continue the ball rolling and continue the conversation going. So anyone have any last words they want to chime in before we basically say? Question. What's that? Uh, question on. Oh, Kent, go ahead. Yeah. Um, one of the things that we talked about today as part of this uh, was the fact that we're looking at more of a holistic document that will cross sort of the boundaries of the four individual working groups. It, it might be good if we formed a maybe ad hoc, maybe uh, official uh, group of folks who are looking at the work across the different boundaries, trying to see how we can actually put together deliverable and get that process going so that if we're shooting for a September or October time frame, that we have um, not only the individual working groups, uh, but we have some uh, idea of how we're actually pulling it all together. I think the sooner we start that effort, the better we're going to be and the easier it's going to be to get done. That is a great idea, Kent. Thank you so much. Uh, are there volunteers uh, from this group that say, hey, this is really important. Uh, we need to have this cross-cutting view. Uh, maybe there's some folks who aren't already track chairs who might be able to uh, take some time and, and really have a, this, this broad-reaching document that's going to be easy to understand, but really helps communicate what we've done. Matt, fantastic. Matt, start the ball rolling. Do we have one or two people who will help out Matt? <laughs> Ralph, we've got the cable world well represented. <laughs> All right. We will, uh, we will solicit some help uh, from the broader community, and I think this is also something that I'm going to uh, ask the already overburdened uh, working group chairs to help out. At least they'll sort of have the situational awareness of what's going on um, so that make, make sure we can have forward progress. Kent, would you like to be involved in that effort? Uh, I sure would, yes. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. I appreciate you uh, giving that up, and uh, Harley? Did, did I hear you say that you had one ask for each working group? Yes. What is, what is oh, the Oh, I'm going to be asking the working groups. Here's what, what do you think the ask for your working group will be? Uh, we can do this remotely, or we can do this right now. I, I guess I, I don't understand. Is this an ask that the working group is making to the yes. lar larger multi-stakeholder body? Yes. OK, great. So this is, we, we, we don't end with just a comma. We end with a, here's what we do next. All right, so again, thank you all. This initiative works because you show up, you get on these conference calls, uh, you read documents, you comment on documents, uh, and that is how we can have community and industry-led solutions to complex social issues. So thank you all very much, and have a great afternoon. Thank you those watching at home. Angela, thank you very much for your help as operator.